Hello, and welcome to the Tech Dirt Podcast. I am Mike Masnick. The world is increasingly technological, so we have better get methodical. Bringing precision to critical digital journalism with the singular vision of a modern monocle. Stopping the copyright bullies from pulling the wall on us. Facing and taking on all the plates and pay to troll. Looking at the ways that they aim to take control. Scrutinizing through their lies and make them fall. If we don't stand up to them, someone will get hurt. To grab a shovel and dig up the tech. If we don't stand up to them, someone will get hurt. To grab a shovel and dig up the tech. I have a somewhat vivid memory back in seventh grade social studies class where the teacher, Mr. Kemp, gave an assignment where all of us had to come up with ways to improve the government. Uh, My suggestion at the time, which was way back in 1987, was to suggest that beyond the executive branch, judicial branch, and legislative branch, that we could have some sort of fourth branch of government, which I called something like the public branch, and that it would involve certain key issues where it was too important for the legislative branch to legislate on their own, but rather would put those issues to a public vote, creating something more like a true democracy rather than a representative democracy. And Mr. Kemp hated it. He told me that I didn't get the point of government at all, and that we already had the legislative branch to act as a people's representative, and that it was silly to suggest any form of more direct democracy. Of course, these days, we actually do have some of that, with things like referendums on local ballots. And of course, some people talk about the potential for things like electronic voting on issues to go directly to the public. This may or may not be a good idea, and the technology for it may or may not be feasible, But it cannot be denied that technology itself has the potential to change democracy in a variety of ways, and not just for voting, but for things like online petitions, flash mobs, crowdfunding, communicating with officials, and much, much more. So today on the Tech Dirt podcast, we wanted to discuss the potential for how technology can impact democracy and whether or not it's actually happening. And to do that, we brought in a special guest. Catherine Bracey was the co-director of the technology field office for Obama for America in 2012, helping to recruit over 100 technologists to volunteer to help build the technology tools that became a key part of the Obama campaign. After the election, she joined Code for America, where she is currently the Senior Director of Partnerships and Ecosystem. In other words, someone with the perfect background for today's discussion with our usual co-hosts, Dennis Yang and Hirsch Reddy. So let's start this off with our guest. Do you think that technology is already changing democracy, and if so, in a good or bad way? Uh, Well, it's undeniable, I think, as you said. It's definitely changing democracy. Uh, I think the results are mixed. Uh, I don't think we really fully understand yet what impact technology is having on um, our system, whether it's good or bad. Um, It's really complicated. So (laughs) is it making it easier for, you know, and it also depends on how, what do you mean when you say democracy? Sure. Do you mean... And and what do you mean by good or (laughs) bad, too? Exactly. Um, Do you mean our electoral process? Do you mean... Um, the facility that citizens have to speak or to have their voices heard? Do you mean um, how our government actually works, you know, to have it actually delivering services or implementing policy? Do you mean that policies are actually con- more consensus-driven? Um, you know, those are, I think the answer is different and, and nuanced in different ways for each of those different definitions of democracy. Sure. So, I mean, we could say all of the above, and then we could be here for, mm-hmm. you know, two or three hours. <laughs> but let's let's focus in. Can, how about we pick an example of something that you, where you think um, technology is having at least an interesting impact, and then we can delve in. Yeah, I mean, I think in elections, certainly, and this was very apparent in the Obama campaign that I w- worked on, and I, mm-hmm. I hope Dennis doesn't get mad at me when I <laughs> out him as having been one of our full-time volunteers in the I tech was. field office in San Francisco. Um, so we firsthand saw how technology was changing elections. I mean, mm-hmm. it was never possible before for someone with Dennis's skill set 
to volunteer, you know, work full time, let alone volunteer to to build the infrastructure for a political campaign. It used to be that what you could do was knock on a door and make a phone call, but um, building software that reached millions of people um, to crunch data or to get people signed up or to help them donate, um, that that didn't exist before. So we certainly have seen a massive revolutionary change in how uh, campaigns, uh, at least in the U.S. and in many other countries as well, are run. Um, so that, I think, is uh, that's been probably the most massive shift. Um, where I am now at Code for America, we focus on the bureaucracy of government. Mm-hmm. Um, technology, unfortunately, has not um, had the same kind of democratizing impact um, in the actual administration of government um, as it mm-hmm. could have, um, and that's what we are trying to change at, at Code for America. And there's obviously ways in which that can go wrong. Um, I think we see, you know, one of the great examples now is um, these algorithms that that help uh, judges determine who should be in jail. Um, you know, <laughs> outsourcing bias, institutional bias to an algorithm is really problematic. There's obviously a ton of privacy concerns when you're talking about opening government data. Sure. So it, it, there are ways that that can, that there are definitely potholes there, but there are so many other ways in which technology can make the experience of government for citizens better, um, can make government services more accessible to the people who need them the most, um, and can help revitalize um, uh, you know, citizen engagement at a, a really grassroots level. How far along in that process do you think we are, right? Because it's, it's very easy. I think a lot of people obviously complain about their interactions with government, which often, you know, are a bit of a mess right now. Yeah. And yet, you know, certainly over the last few years, we've started to see, you know, if you look, there are certain examples here and there of much more... Um, uh, I guess I would say user-friendly uh, setups within government, and, and I've been noticing that systems are changing, but slowly and only in certain mm-hmm. areas. So how far along? I mean, I guess it's it's a process that's always going to involve continually changing, but, but you know, I guess how far along do you think we are? Um, not very far along. Okay. <laughs> I think um, we have the... The biggest contribution that Code for America, I can speak for just for Code for America in the space, we're five years old now. Mm -hmm. I think we have uh, uh, defined the problem. And it turns out the problem is really big. (laughs) Um, And there are many ways we could be approaching the problem. And so we've just made like the very first um, step. You know, it's almost like we validated the hypothesis and now it's like, okay, we know everything that's screwed up and needs to be fixed. Now we have to go fix it. Um, so very, very, very early. Um, but I think there are really, I mean, we, we are really confident that our approach is making a difference. And if we continue to build on that approach, um, obviously iterating over time, um, we will, we will see the change that we hope to see over the long term. So specifically with Code for America, how does it I mean, it's not a part of the government, right? And, mm-hmm. and the, the government now has a few new organizations that are trying to help on building better technologies. You have things like U.S. Digital Services and 18F that have been getting a lot of press lately. Um, so how does uh, Code for America sort of compare to, to the in-government operations? Mm-hmm. So we're a um, nonprofit. Mm-hmm. So we uh, consult with government. Um, we work at the local level uh, pretty much exclusively because okay. um, we're very much focused on service delivery and um, local governments are the ones who are actually implementing policy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we um, we work with those local agencies on a consulting basis. I see. So, uh, so are, you, are you making software or are you guys kind of making policy recommendations or like how does that actually work? Kind of all of the above, but we focus on... Um, uh, the point at which a citizen interacts with right. the government service okay. um, and making that experience huh. better. And it turns out that when you start looking at why that experience is really crappy, there's a right. whole bunch of upstream <laughs> reasons that need to be addressed e- either through technology or policy changes. We demonstrate the need to make those changes mm-hmm. by building technology and showing that there's a better way to do things and then you know, creating the political will through delivering better outcomes to change the upstream 
um, uh, issues so that the, the, the change that we've instituted at the, the citizen level, the, mm-hmm. the interface to government, is sustainable. Can, do, do you have, like, a representative example of where you guys have done something yeah, like that? Yeah, um, here in San Francisco, mm-hmm. and we, um, we actually, I should say, we focus in four specific areas, health, um, mm-hmm. which is more like human services, not mm-hmm. health care, um, safety and justice, economic development, and communications and engagement. Um, in our health focus area, we've been working with the Human Services Agency in San Francisco for about two years now on making the enrollment process in CalFresh, which is the state's food stamps program, mm-hmm. easier. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we like to talk about um, y- making the experience with government better. And for people in our socioeconomic circle, that means I know when the next train is coming, and that's great. And that's a great. Um, development, um, but we don't interact with government at the same level that um, right. poor and disenfranchised people do. So right. this particular um, interaction with government is worse than anything you have ever experienced in government. And yeah. it is it robs people of their dignity. Um, it doesn't deliver good outcomes. It's actually um, mm-hmm. literally just a broken system. And so um, we've been working with San Francisco County um, in California, the CalFresh program is administered at the county level mm-hmm. um, to re- uh, reform how people sign up for food stamps. And um, we started, we learned, we got into that program with them by just creating a simple, what we thought was going to be simple tool to alert people when they're about to be um, kicked off the rolls, uh, which we found through our research, it turns out that before then, most people were finding out they were going to get kicked off. They were kicked off of food stamps when they showed up at the grocery store with a a cart full of groceries and tried to swipe their EBT card and it didn't work. So that's obviously not a great experience. Um, And so we just created a simple SMS notification app that would send people a text that said, you're about to lose your benefits. You need to call this number in order to, you know, submit whatever needed to be submitted. Um, That turned into um, revising the whole uh, enrollment flow. Hmm. And we're now working, have a working prototype that gets people from step one to the end, um, of enrolling in food stamps and are working with the state to, to hopefully, um, spread that to other counties in California and potentially, I mean, given that California is the most populous state, um, and has, I think something like the second lowest enrollment in food stamps in the country or something that is very low, um, can hopefully spread across the country. Cool. And uh, that's really just through design. I mean, the technology there is not complicated at all. Right. It's really just redesigning yeah. the I mean, user I, interface. And, and I think that's an issue that comes up a lot when, when people who are used to using a variety of different web services that you know are modern and, and sort of up-to-date, and then they go use a government service that was you know, probably originally implemented, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and it just feels completely out of date. And people often wonder, like, why... Why are government websites so bad? Mm-hmm. <laughs> what, we we wonder that all the time. <laughs> one of my friends who uh, used to work for a contractor that actually made the back ends for some of these services, I was describing to him, there's a particular agency that I have to deal with for export regulations, and their website is, um, is, is definitely dated. Um, and I was just sort of describing the way the system works, and he was giving me the the budget of what it took to build that type of a website for another agency and it was extraordinary it was hundreds of millions of dollars it, it was it was nuts well i don't want to out anybody on, on <laughs> you podcast. laugh i mean that's it, the... it was it was extraordinary and then i and i asked him so why why how come it was, why was it that expensive like microsoft would give you an amazing quote uh to build the exact same thing if you were like nabisco or somebody like that and he said, well, believe it or not, like when people quote, make quotes to the government, they just inflate them. And everyone knows you could build a similar system for like GM and it would be a lot cheaper. And I, I think, so part of the issue is just that doing IT stuff for the government, there's a lot of stuff that isn't, that has kind of nothing to do with sort of exactly what needs to be delivered. And there's a lot of sort of human factor and political issues that, that go on in kind of the background where you, you can't necessarily, well, you know, another completely different example, but somebody was telling me of an example of an agency where um, 
in order to preserve certain documents, they had to, they would get digital copies of the documents, and then this, that department would print the documents, and then that, those documents were again scanned and put on disk by another department. Mm -hmm. So it's a very roundabout kind of thing they did. And it was almost impossible to solve that issue because there's so many people in, in those different departments doing those steps. Mm -hmm. And some people's entire jobs depend on that, and there's entire departments that do that. And you can't just slash everyone's jobs. Mm -hmm. and, and so it was, even though there was a very common sense solution, which was, hey, why don't you just give the digital documents from this agency directly to the other agency? Mm -hmm. um, you, could, you can't do that. And there's like, there's, there's, so there's weird things like that. So I think you guys are in the best place in terms of improving government services because you can build UIs and things to sort of streamline services on the edge, mm -hmm. going directly to the citizens. Whereas if you had to do something that was an interface between two government agencies or required any, you know, making something more efficient in sort of the back end, I think that would be such a humongous task. Yeah. Because it, would, it, would be, it would be intractable almost. So I think. Well, that's where, we're at, where we are finding ourselves now, right? Like we can build apps all day long, but if they're not actually embedded into the system of how, mm -hmm. you know, policy is made and services get designed, mm -hmm. then it's going to just be a flashy, superficial thing that isn't actually having an impact in anyone's life. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we think that that, you know, the, the power of the technology or the app is to create a little foothold and like we can get our foot in the door mm -hmm. with that to just demonstrate in a very concrete way how things could be working better um and that sp spurs a new conversation you don't even have to have a conversation about policy it, you know and sort of like this abstract thirty thousand foot ideological you know conversation about like all the things that could go wrong because that's when government you know the bureaucrats mm -hmm. brain is now churning on like oh crap like who's <laughs> you know whose remit is that and all that stuff you just say look when we designed it this way mm -hmm. you got a better outcome for the people you are serving and it you know i you might be surprised to hear that a lot of people who work in government are there because they want to help people um, and that and and that really changes the conversation, and then allows us to get down the road, build the trust, and to the, get to the point where we can say you need to change systems. And that's where I think we are now. But it's just you're right, and it, there's so many reasons why the system works that way. Um, one of them is that we don't, as citizens, don't have a lot of tolerance for government experimenting and doing things a different way. And so, you know, there's the old adage: no one ever got fired for going with IBM. Um, they have a set of contractors that they know, and there's a whole bunch of rules about who can contract with government, which are intended to prevent corruption. Um, and the ones who can get navigate that system are the ones who win the contracts, and there aren't that many people in government who understand how software gets built. Yeah. And frankly, all of these changes in you know, how software gets built happened in the last 20 years, um, which is like a drop in the bucket of time for government and like uh, mm -hmm. e eon for the right. technology world. So. I mean, it is, is San Francisco kind of more, I mean, tech is all here, right? So a lot, or a lot of it. Is San, is San Francisco government more open to it? I mean, I, like, I'm a personal fan of, like we have an app called 311 that I'm a big fan of, which is basically you can, I guess 311 is a phone number you can call and complain about stuff, but the app itself actually, you can go on it and like take a picture of some trash that's on the street and like someone will come and clean it up. And mm -hmm. to me it's kind of an amazing like interface from like for me and government services that like I never actually realized that I could do that before. Um, but that one is awesome. I think S SF Park is another one where you can actually mm -hmm. look at all the available parking spots. I don't know if that like it just mm -hmm. feels it feels like like San other Francisco like, is more welcoming. I mean I don't like I don't know. I mean I was you know the only other city I really had that much experience with in my working life is Austin and in, I don't know if if there was as many kind of apps or initiatives in Austin as we have here, but you know, I think there. there's obviously in San Francisco much more of a yeah. political <laughs> uh, incentive for right. the city to be innovative. Um, so they have they have done great stuff, and you know, it, it helps for us to be four blocks from City Hall here yeah. in San Francisco. Um, we also do a lot of work with the City of Oakland, um, and they have been really um, ahead of the curve. Uh, in a lot of ways, we are um, rebuilding their website from the ground up in like a very innovative, revolutionary, not just like let's let's redesign the website, but let's redesign how information gets published and shared yeah. um, in the city of Oakland. So 
they've been on the front lines. And, and you know, lots of cities across the U.S. Um, have been really leading the way and uh, some really courageous, frankly, politicians and, and uh, government officials who have invited us in and, and um, been our real partners on this work. Yeah. I mean, is, isn't that ultimately the, the big win in terms of, like, government is, is the flow of information, right? Like, it's much easier now to get access to things that are happening in government, around government, than ever before, right? I mean... Well, there's, there's also, I mean, you know, separate from the flow of information, there's other, there's other valuable things you can get from this, you know, just the fact that everyone has a smartphone in their hand or just the fact that the cost of computing has gone down so much. I mean, we're, we're looking at a lot of American examples, but, for example, in India, they, there's a huge amount of corruption associated with their welfare system. A lot of a huge portion of the funds that are supposed to go to rural the rural poor are actually diverted by middlemen, and so the Indian government just created this scheme where everyone gets these specific ID numbers and ID cards that are associated with them in a specific bank account, so that funds can go directly to individuals, and that's basically you know that single-handedly will probably do more for the rural poor in India than all these other kinds of schemes, just because the money that's allocated for them will, for the first time, actually get into their hands. And that doesn't sound like a very high tech thing, but really, what's well, made national it possible. ID cards, and they're like yeah. biometric or something crazy yeah. too, yeah. Um, uh, because illiteracy is an issue. But mm-hmm. um, that's pretty sophisticated te- government <laughs> technology, I think. It, well, there are also obviously some yeah. privacy issues and all that. Like, what does it mean to have a? a but a, if you but if you look at it from sort of a a, a per capita expenditure, it's actually quite cheap. Yeah, and yeah. It, and it's not rocket science. It's like America could easily do that. There's political barriers. And well, functionally, those, I mean, when yeah. we're talking about like user experience here and the, the citizen experience, it, functionally, what that policy means is that you you're giving direct cash transfers to citizens because mm-hmm. it's money they weren't receiving before. You know, right. mm-hmm. um, and they don't know why, right? It's obviously getting skimmed off the top at various points along the way because that's what happens when you move cash through a system. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's more money in people's pockets at the end of the day, and that's an economic stimulus program, right? Yep. In um, in all and for all intents and purposes. So, it is technology, but it's technology to serve this purpose of. And they're probably putting more money back into the economy <laughs> yeah. by investing in this exactly. technology than um, than it would cost. And you know, even beyond just sort of the direct cash transfers, there's there's a lot more monitoring now in the system when it comes to things like when there's a cash outlay. For well, outlay for a public school, say in a village, right? They can have better monitoring of what students are actually there, mm-hmm. um, whether the teacher is actually showing up, because that's a huge teacher absenteeism is like a huge problem in India, where somebody has a, a, a teaching job and that it, it's you know they don't actually show up to teach; they subcontract out the job to somebody else. <laughs> I'm serious, and they pay them a salary and then they go and do something mm-hmm. else. It's strange, uh, but. You know, this is an issue. And so those kinds of things, those weren't monitorable. You would think they would be very easy to monitor because you just put a human being there and then they check, is there a teacher? But that person now needs a watchman as well because right. they could be corrupted. And, and you also get... can't, I mean, to do it at scale is hugely expensive. Exactly. Um, um, and, you know, so aside from sort of the online education and all these other kinds of ways of decentralizing education and bringing it to people, there's also just, you know, all the monitoring things that you can do as government. And, and even, I mean, part of that is, is, I mean, as you said, with people who have mobile phones, like distributing the power out mm-hmm. to, the, to the ends rather than relying on sort of a centralized system to, to, to you know, handle all of that. Of course, again, I mean, there are issues with, you know, and potential privacy issues with, like, the, the ID cards, and it's certainly been a big concern among some. Mm-hmm. And then also you have things where you have, like, the monitoring stuff. Like, I, I was just reading recently about here in, in the Bay Area, um, I, I, don't, I don't know if BART is technically government. I guess it, it is, is government, government yeah. right? So it's Bar- a regional transportation authority. You're, yeah, okay. So Bay Area Regional Transit. You're right, you're <laughs> right. I stand corrected. So the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, BART had uh, pushed out an app to people to allow them to report bad things that they saw on the train. And they just came out with this report about what people were reporting. And sometimes it's bad things, but often it's it appears to be very racist things where you know the, you know they're reporting people that they don't like or people that they're uncomfortable with on seems the train seems suspicious exactly <laughs> and it seems suspicious is like a, a big part of the reporting and so then you worry about you know you know how do you balance those kinds of things and it's great that that you know you're putting pushing power out to the ends and allowing people to do things but you also have to recognize that there are risks and and consequences to doing it that way as well 
Yeah, we, you know, one of the, we, we've talked in this conversation a lot about redesigning service delivery, but there's also a data-driven decision-making aspect here, mm -hmm. too. And I mentioned the, um, uh, you know, how we, algorithms we use to decide uh, who, goes to, who goes to jail or who gets what kind of sentence. Um, you know, those embed bias, and um, some mm -hmm. of them are not very transparent. And so thinking about um, how we use data to make decisions um, mm -hmm. is a really important part of this conversation as well. It can go... I mean, it's obviously, you know, massively needed um, in every aspect, but we're just being co cognizant of how it can be misused is, is really important as well. Who, who's using an algorithm to put people in jail? Is that actually being done? There's, uh, I forget what it's called, but there's a, there is a score. There's like a, um, that's used in the sentencing mm -hmm. process. And it's not in use in every jurisdiction, but um, many um, uh, judges or people who are sentencing people um, will use the score as an input to their decision about, uh, and, and, you know, ostensibly you're, t you're, you're helping to take human bias, like the actual right. bias that the judge holds mm -hmm. out of the equation. But, but, um, but you're reinforcing whatever is existing. Yeah. Like some problem? of the, or, or some the, of the, the things, programmer's bias. I mean, it could yeah. be yeah, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the elements that make up the algorithm. Like in some cases, there's a great, um, talk by a woman named Kathy O'Neill, mm -hmm. um, uh, weapons of math destruction is uh, <laughs> a name of, the name of a talk, and it might be the name of a book she's writing right now. And she mm -hmm. give a talk at PDF. I recommend everyone go watch it. But um, you know the 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 uh, the algorithms are trade secrets, mm -hmm. but um, in some cases we know that uh, some elements of it are things like. So were your so parents, did your parents finish high school or were your parents, huh. would either of your parents what? have a felony? And that's part of their consideration. And, and, for but whether but is, that, is that inversely proportional to your like? I don't, I don't so, know. So yeah. is this, is, if it helps yeah. mitigate, that would make sense. Well, but, so, so wait, so because I wasn't familiar with this either, but so these are, these are algorithms created by private companies mm -hmm. that are then being used by judges in... That, so she talks seat? about one in, um, I, again... I feel like I'm a little, <laughs> like a little bit out of my depth now, but I highly recommend that people look into her work. Um, uh, the New York City School District um, mm -hmm. uses an algorithm to rate teachers, um, and it's part of their, um, you know, the evaluation process for teachers and the new like union contracting. You know, there's this, all this controversy about between teachers unions and education yeah. reform people. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the score that gets generated comes from a company, which I believe is in Wisconsin. And um, the uh, factors that go into the score are because of the contract between this company and, and the school district, um, private. They can't actually get access to how they're calculating um, the scores. That um, seems very, very Or how they're waiting certain things. <laughs> so the teachers, you know, it's one thing to give them the score, but it's another to say you get the score and we also can't tell you what you could do right. to improve it. Right. Um, I mean, that's, that, yeah, that's, that's, that's troublesome on many different levels. Yeah. So anyway, if I've screwed any of that up, I <laughs> deeply apologize and I should be Googling while I'm talking right now. But. Um, wow, that's actually well. Non-transparent, deterministic things that 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 basically have a huge influence on your life that you have no ability to sort of <laughs> it's inspect. Like science I mean, that's, fiction. That's, that's that's absurd. Yeah, but you know what? Like you know, even if you didn't have a computerized algorithm, a lot of the times when you deal with government for things like licenses and things like that, the process will feel exactly the same way. Even mm -hmm. though there's all human beings very involved, opaque. Yeah. it's very opaque. You have no reason. You have no. Uh, you have no information about why some other business situated exactly the same as you got a license and mm -hmm. you were denied a license. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, then you see two people golfing and you're like, oh, okay, well, that kind of makes sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, you know, that kind of stuff can, that, and you don't get any feedback there either. So, but at least with the human beings, you know that if they do something completely untoward, the FBI will come knocking. Right, yeah. but with an algorithm, there's no. Oh. It's just yeah. Yeah. well, it happens a lot. You know, it doesn't it happen happens for every. Sometimes, yeah. uh, but but I mean, but even even if you take out like the blatant yeah. illegality, right, which is what you're talking about, you still have situations where where like you have all different things happening, where it is kind of an opaque process, and so I can understand the appeal of well, if we do it al algorithmically, we're standardizing it, and we're sort of guaranteeing that it's standardized, but. 
you're increasing how opaque the overall situation is and you're relying on the biases of however that system was yeah. programmed. And I, 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 The I, only reason to keep it opaque uh -huh. would be so that people couldn't game it, perhaps. Sure. I can't think of any other reason. Well, but I mean, the trade secret reason, if it's a private... Well, that, does Google make their algorithm public? Well, that, but that's a little different, right? Because, well, that's, like, I mean, but that's yeah, the argument yeah. they're making, so, right? So, right, so, so, I mean, if you, if you flip it around, and I don't want to get too far away from the core discussion, but, I mean, you <laughs> could argue, like, right, so right now, all these people are working on things like autonomous vehicles, right? And the algorithms that run those autonomous vehicles will remain private also, and yet people will put their lives in that algorithm's hand, Right. Yeah, but that's not... So this is where the issue of trust comes in, and sure. I think this is really important um, because, we, you know, we started out talking about democracy, and we've, we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about the actual administration of government, uh -huh. which, you know, non-democracies administer government too, right? But in democracies, they, you know, the democracy depends on trust. And I, we think, I think, that the that trust that people have in government doesn't come from the election necessarily. It comes from these day-to-day, -day, sometimes very invisible interactions with government. Right. Um, when you go to sign up for food stamps or you go to register your business or you you know, um, are trying to find out why your teacher score is what it is, mm -hmm. that every single small little way that we interact with government and it doesn't work for us or it's opaque or you know, seems a little bit corrupt erodes trust. And that, you know, we wonder why people don't vote. We wonder why, you know, no one thinks, you know, Congress is a disaster for a lot of its own making. But, you know, I think a lot of that sense that um, I, why would I participate? It's not, mm -hmm. you know, I, the way that it manifests in my day to day life is totally like I can't I can't trust it. Um, and that's where I think making services better delivered, better making data more transparent um, and re-engaging people in the process of actually building these tools and these services um, is going to help restore trust in democracy overall, not just in the administration of government, but in democracy. Right. So if, we're, if people want to actually believe that their government is working for them, they have to be able to trust their government and, yeah. and recognize that you know, when they do have an issue, that the government is responsive. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that um, the, the other key thing is that there's this term that mostly academics use called efficacy, mm -hmm. that when they see something that's broken, they feel like there's something they can do about it, right? So when you have your 311 app. And, but that's what's so amazing about it. Like, I think I, you know, you know, if you take a picture of a bunch of trash that's on this corner here in San Francisco, within a day, it'll be gone. And yeah. that's, it feels really awesome to be able to interact with the, with the government with, with something that you click on something, you take a picture of it, and then within a day, you see a pickup truck come by and, and clean it up. Mm -hmm. like, that's amazing. It's, it's amazing. amazing. It's an amazing <laughs> feeling. And like, what would you have see, done? See, yeah. What would you have done before? You know, I, you would have seen I, the I pile of trash. I would have complained about it. I would have been like, ah, oh, you know, living in Selma, it's, I'm walking over trash and, you know, other things all the time. Right. And now I feel like I can do something about it. It's like, And I do. And I, like, I, I take pictures see, of things. No, there's, there's a part of me, like, I hear that story and... and yeah. And and I'm amazed that you think that's amazing. Like that seems like well that that seems like, you know, of course it should do but, that. But, but should... I think that that's kind of where we are. Like I think like I don't know if this is. So I used to have a complaint where, you know, every night every week there's I have one night of trash pickup and one night of street cleaning, mm -hmm. and without fail, the street cleaning would happen about 30 minutes before my weekly trash pickup. So what would happen is my my block is only clean for about 27 minutes, <laughs> and I tweeted it and. It might have been coincidence, but like two weeks later, that reversed, <laughs> and and the trash pickup happened first, and now the and the street cleaning now comes after the trash pickup, and I have no idea right. if my tweet had anything to do with it, but as long as it feels like it, it did. felt like it, and <laughs> it made me kind of feel like I kind of made a difference, and I, like things things are working. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, things are working. That's yeah. kind of it, it feels yeah. good. I mean, it, I guess I guess that's true. I just had a, a recent experience, which was. Um, uh, on uh, July Fourth, I went to I went to the parade in Redwood City, and uh, during the parade, they paraded out some um, uh, military equipment that the police <laughs> oh had. My God. And I that, this, that's a whole other that's other a whole other issue for a whole <laughs> yeah. other podcast. But but I I took a picture and I tweeted it and I said to you know at Redwood City or whatever like yeah. hey. Uh, this is uh, doesn't make me feel safe. Uh, kind of the opposite. 
And it took like almost a week, but they actually responded and, and said like, you know, we, we hear you. That it actually wasn't like it wasn't from Redwood City itself. And, uh, <laughs> Pass the buck. <laughs> yeah, there was some passing of the buck, but they said like, you know, I, I don't remember exactly what they said, but it was something Im- implying that they wouldn't be doing, right. they wouldn't allow that anymore in the future. Mm. And so even just that little interaction was like, right. oh, you know, someone was actually listening, right. which I didn't know, you know, I didn't necessarily right. expect, but it, it certainly did and I think make the, it you feel know, more responsive. Before before this technology was here, like we had town hall meetings, you know, like where people can go and well, complain. Well, we still do, and, but no one goes. Yeah. <laughs> so now we just complain. Yeah. We don't have to go. Mm-hmm. So if, awesome. we were to, if we were to summarize kind of all the things that have uh, technology has made better for the working of government. It would be things like things like Twitter. It means magnified voice, right? Yeah. There's uh, better transparency, more information because yeah. there's all these different ways you can get it, uh, and better ways of digesting the information and under- understanding it. So not only just crowdsourcing and stuff like that, but we have better analytical tools, right? So if a citizen is interested, they can boot up their PC and do a few Excel manipulations and pivot tables <laughs> and figure out where there's a little discrepancy in the budget, that kind of thing. And then finally, I think like a really important thing that we haven't discussed, and maybe it's a little bit on the side, is you know, the fact that you were able to take a photo of something on the street. The ubiquitous surveillance aspect of there being cameras everywhere, I think is really important in the way government works as well. Mm-hmm. Not just on the law enforcement side. I think when you know there was some video that was circulating on YouTube, and we haven't really touched on this, but it showed a garbage man wrecking someone's front yard out of frustration. And there's that video, uh, you know, in, so a, this in, is, a, in another this is, place. This is another not pl- necessarily surveillance. It's the opposite, right, that you're talking about, which is sort of... Uh, what do they call it? Surveillance, I think, was the what's, phrase that someone talked about. Where it's difference? basically like surveillance is government looking yeah. down on you, and surveillance is you looking back up. Okay, at, surveillance. So it'd be like body cams, or yeah. you know, like yeah, the, yeah, I mean, the ACLU app where you can right. send video directly to ACLU, or any of those kinds of things. But basically, putting you know, I think what you're really talking about, and what a lot of things we've been talking about, was sort of putting the power back into the hands of the citizens, yeah. as opposed to just relying on mm-hmm. the government, and that actually speaks directly to kind of the concept of democracy, right? Well, this actually gets at the thing I I wanted to talk about, which is also where I think technology has made a huge difference in democracy, is that, and and Dennis is a a walking, talking example (laughs) of this, like uh, citizens can actually build stuff now that that is government. So these are Mm -hmm. services that government uh, delivers that citizens are helping to build with government. And before, you know, the ways that you could interact are you, you outlined at the beginning. You can sign a petition. You can um, uh, register to vote. You can, um, you know, participate in an election. You can show up at a town hall meeting. And now there's a way for people with a particular skill set, mm-hmm. um, many of your listeners, who could say, actually, I can fix that. I have a, um, I ride BART. I live in Oakland and work in San Francisco, and I ride BART every day to come into the office. And I've noticed lately that it seems like there are more delays on the trains. And so I sit there really frustrated on the train, like, God, this is so annoying. I know BART, I can't actually write code myself. I know BART has an API. I know that it's probably theoretically possible if I had technology skills to take that data and build an app that will, um, you could do a data visualization about the on-time arrivals, but you mm-hmm. could also do something with like reporting and add a citizen. Um, you know, I'm on this train and it's delayed because X. Um, I think that, um, you know, the ability for someone to build that, like that is magic to me. And that is such a profound manifestation of democracy that you could actually get off the train and go to your computer and write the thing that would help you answer that question Mm -hmm. instead of just having to stand on the train and be frustrated and sweaty and annoyed. Um, that is so like, cause you just have write letters before and now you can actually maybe do something. That is so much power. Um, and so I think there's that like being able to solve your own problem. And we see a lot of technologists solving their own problem. Mm -hmm. When you work with government, when you take those skills to work with government, you are solving everyone's problem by definition because government has to work for everyone. Um, and so getting plugging technologists into this opportunity to help rebuild government um, is such a powerful thing. And um, then to hopefully share those skills with others so we have other people um, who don't have technology skills now but can down the road help build solutions to their own problems. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's very cool. Of course, that's also dependent on 
like that API being available, and which now more and more cities are willing to do that. But but the more you, know. you build on an API, the more that that is a self reinforcing cycle. Yeah. So if well, we you, have more people you, building on that, then there are going to be more people, more governments are yeah. willing to publish the data yeah. and build the APIs. Yeah, because I know that there were concerns about that in the past, and you, but you you always still worry about like if someone does something that people don't like, and then suddenly they shut down the API. But but overall, <laughs> mm-hmm. not not you know not always resorting to the, the negative point of view. But no, I, I think that's good. So. Um, we're running out of time here, but as sort of a final thought, I wanted to discuss where do you think, you know, what's coming next, right? So we've talked about all the things that have been happening now and a couple of things that are in the past. But what do you, you know, if you had a guess, which, what sort of development in, in terms of, you know, improving democracy through technology is, is next on the, uh, on the docket, what would it be? Yeah, so, I mean, I, uh, I can tell you what's next on our list. I think... Um, the, we have spent a lot of time showing what's possible, building apps. And like I said earlier, now it's time to take that experience and turn it into real structural change. So we're, we are very laser focused on, can we get technologists turned onto public service as a career opportunity? Um, a lot of the problems that we see boil down to human resources. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, can you can you go work in government for a couple of years or start a, a GovTech startup? And uh, there are people funding that now. That's a yeah. big one. Um, make using the technology to drive the upstream policy change. That is also hugely important to us right now. So when it comes to food stamps, can we help change the way, you know, the, the things that are broken about the policy that force the downstream interactions um, with citizens to be bad? That That's something um, that we're really focused on. Um, and then just spreading the movement, like I said, and, 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 you know, my, the kind of airy fairy dream is that everyone everywhere, anytime sees something that's broken and can take Dennis's three one one app and feel that, I mean, it's hard to articulate how powerful that feeling is that, you know, especially for people who have been left out of the system for so long, yeah, right. when they feel like there's an outlet, an avenue for them to not just voice their opinion, but actually take change into their own hands and um, by doing so strengthen their relationship with local government. That's where I think um, we really need to take this is a much more kind of inclusive and democratic space. I don't know. I think uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that that's, that's what will happen. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. A very interesting discussion. And uh, I know uh, for, for people who are enjoying this discussion and want more, Catherine will be back with us next week on a slightly different discussion. So uh, we'll uh, uh, talk to you then. <laughs> yes, and if you want to do this work with us, if you're now inspired to do this work, uh, codeforamerica.org, and there are many ways that you can get involved where you live. Exactly. All right. Well, thanks again. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back next week. Bye.